Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Everybody, it's Joshua Fields Milburn. And this is Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. And today we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation. We're recording this six days after the United States presidential election. So this is the Monday after the Tuesday, which is the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November 2016. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really know today's date, but it is six days after the presidential election. We were going to record this last week, but um, <clears throat> I got a, a little sick, and I got more sick throughout the week, and then my voice was just gone. I, I didn't want to come in and just cough on the mic for 30 minutes. And so Ryan and I are just going to have a, a conversation today. I, I've got a few notes, but not much. And I was going to write something about this election mm. because so many people are surprised. So many people are distraught. Mm -hmm. So many people are excited, elated, happy, joyful. So many people are afraid, are terrified. They're, they're living in fear. I, I think that we're at a point now where, where there are people who, who are maybe even both at the same time, right. excited and, and afraid. And so most of you know that this show is rather apolitical. It's an atypical show, but it's also a apolitical show, meaning we don't get on here and espouse our personal political We don't talk beliefs. politics. We don't usually talk religion. <clears throat> right. There are, there are topics that we typically avoid, but, but today we're going we're gonna to dive into it. Yeah, and I, although I think that this will still be a relatively apolitical sh show. I, I don't, Ryan, I never asked you who you voted for, and I'm not going to ask you here on, on the air, obviously. But I think it'd be safe to say I wouldn't be surprised if you and I voted for, for, di for different people. Probably. I, I know that in the... Uh, primaries, we certainly supported different people, mm -hmm. and many of our friends are, we, that we have are, are going to be anywhere on the political spectrum from Republican and conservative to Democrat and socialist and libertarian and Green Party. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I've talked to quite a few friends over the, the past week and, and people from all over the spectrum and had conversations trying to better understand. And I think really the 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 place where I am, I was shocked that that Donald Trump became president of the United States. He's president elect right now, and I was truly shocked when that happened. I yeah. I never thought that could happen, good, bad, or indifferent. I just it didn't I didn't expect it to happen, right? Well, yeah. I mean, he doesn't. You know, th there's the political experience isn't there. Uh, you know, he he's been known to be a re reality TV star. So, you know, just like a lot of people years ago. When, when, I mean, he tried to run, I think, in 2012 I think he start, first started for talking, a second. Yeah. He started talking about in 88, 1988. So, <laughs> wow. So a long, long time yeah, ago. Yeah. So it, it's, but, but he's such a controversial figure that, that you didn't anticipate. Some, and he's had so many of these gaffes that had any other politician had these gaffes, it would have automatically sort of disqualified them. Like I, I right. can think back to um, – uh, uh, politicians like John Kerry, who was a, a pretty typical politician, right, career politician. But when he said, I voted for the war before I voted against it, or, or, or maybe right. it was vice versa. Whatever like that was it. And, and in fact, if you were to step back and, and, and talk about that, you could explain what he was talking about. Well, mm -hmm. I voted for this thing until – until the thing changed, or until I got more information as well. And then, of course, I changed my mind. I voted against it. But it, it made him feel like this squishy sort of politician, even though you, it, in a soundbite it made him sound like a, a squishy politician. But, but by and large, it, it was an explainable comment if you were to step back and, and, and do a, a deeper dive. Well, there were many gaffes throughout this, this campaign, for sure, and we're not going to get into the, to the, the nitty-gritty or the, the politics of yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, before we even get deeper into this conversation, I just want to say for the listeners, like, first off, if I was listening to this, I, I would probably... Like not listen to a uh, political debate between two of my, or not debate, but a political conversation, just because I'm so tired of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to let people know that you know this is not a this is not going to be a bashing session. This is not uh, like my whole goal of this conversation between you and I is for me to 
uh, hold back any negative comments when it comes to anything or anyone. I mean, I think it's just uh, this is going to be more of a conversation about kind of a pulse on where we feel like the country's at and, 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 and kind of a discussion more than a, than a debate or, you know, tearing people down or anything. Totally agree. In fact, I think that a big chunk of this election was pretty much just a, a repudiation of a lot of that that sentiment that's going on in the country right now, the tearing down from both sides. You know, you were this and you were this, and I'm going to blame this person or blame this person right. or blame, blame, blame. And I want to do the opposite of that because I think it, it is easy at first, our first instinct, maybe as human beings or maybe just as our culture, is to step back and blame. And on the surface, there are a lot of people you could blame for this outcome. Sure. Whether you're a Trump supporter, a Hillary supporter, a third-party supporter. Or whether you didn't whatever. vote. Yeah, you're a non-voter. You can blame a lot of people. And so I sort of made a list. Like At first, I saw, I saw election night. Instantly, people started blaming the people who voted for third parties. So like Jill Stein or... Gary Johnson right. supporters, and and they were really upset that that other people voted for for someone else as opposed to voting for their candidate. Well, first off, I, I understand the sentiment, but I, I think I think that sentiment by itself is mistaken. And, and the reason I think that is, well, the numbers just don't bear out. If if everyone who voted for a third party person, which by the way is your right as an American, and you know I, I think most of us would agree that the two party system hasn't worked very well. And that's why we actually got a Donald Trump who is very much a sort of third party candidate, doesn't conform to the ideals of, of, of either party. But what I found is that people who are blaming these, these third party, these, the, these other entities, whether it's, it's Jill Stein, Gary Johnson, Evan McMullen, et cetera, it, people who voted for them, most of them, the, the exit polls show, Ryan, that that 55% of them would have just stayed home if they wouldn't have voted for a third party. Right. And then it was pretty split down the middle. It, 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 it moved a little bit toward Hillary in, in this race. But, but in all honesty, if you would have taken all, the aggregate of all the third party people, it would have split between Hillary and Trump. And neither person, you wouldn't have had a different outcome is my point. Right. And so, in fact, what I would, would encourage people is that if you were strongly supporting a third party th- third party person but you but you said well you know i the reason i don't vote for a third party is because they could never win well why can't they ever win well because no one ever votes for a third party it's this weird circular logic we'll never end up getting a, a another person outside of this two party fold uh, this two party recipe if we don't if we don't start looking at these other parties and taking them more seriously so if you're discontented by by the third parties uh, maybe instead of placing the blame on them, let, let's place the, 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 the blame on the bigger system. Well, that's also a problem, right? So, so we, have, uh, we have people who are now blaming the Democrats, right? Well, you should have brought in Bernie Sanders or, or Joe Biden or, or Martin O'Malley or, or, or whomever, O'Malley. right? And, and, I mean, I understand why you'd want to blame that as well. You, th- there is a, there is, uh, some, s- there's certainly some logic to, s- to say in hindsight, well, uh, Democrats didn't run the perfect candidate, uh, and that's why she lost, right? Well, it's true. I mean, but there are also, there are no such thing as perfect candidates. There are some candidates who are better than others. And in this election, uh, quite often we heard people say it's the, it's the lesser of two evils, and you're voting for the lesser of two evils. The problem with that is what? Well, some people thought Donald Trump was the lesser of two evils, right. and some people thought that Hillary Clinton was the lesser of, of two evils. And there are certainly compelling arguments from both sides. And I was talking to a friend of ours, and I promised him I wouldn't name his name. Uh, but this weekend, we had a, an hour-long conversation. And I think you and I, Ryan, we, we, we are we're going to struggle with the, the same thing here throughout this conversation is he's a pastor in the South. And so you know who I'm talking about. We Probably. went to high school with, with this person. Yes. And um, he doesn't share the same beliefs as I do, for sure. Uh, but I think we have similar values. And uh, he, didn't, he, he personally didn't vote for Donald Trump. But he knows that most of his congregation did vote for Donald Trump. Yeah. And he also knows that he can't get out there. And, and so, so he had a, a sort of staff meeting the, the day after the election. And he goes, he just wanted to take everyone's temperature. Hey, how's everyone doing here today? Because he knows he didn't vote for him. And so he was sort of projecting his own feelings and saying, you know what? 
I, I, well, I think what he was saying is, you know what, like, we're going to get through this together. But then he realized, like, oh, everyone here is, like, really excited yeah. about this outcome. Right. He's like, wait a minute. I realize I can't go out and, and share my political beliefs in front of the congregation because some of them won't be able to then take my message of what I'm trying to teach or preach to them. Uh, they won't take it seriously. And the same thing for the people who support Hillary Clinton. That, that if he were to come out and say that he is really excited, yeah, yeah, the, uh, he's it, or, or if he would have said I voted for Donald Trump, mm-hmm. the people who supported Hillary Clinton would have been like, well, now I can't take your messages seriously either. Right. And so that's why I think Ryan and I are walking on on a bit of a tightrope here. Is our message is apolitical? Living a meaningful life with less. When we go out on the road, we certainly have Trump supporters. We have Hillary supporters. We have. Republicans, Democrats, we have people who don't vote. We have high school kids who can't vote. Uh, we have, have people who have never voted in their lives, and they're living in their 80s or 90s who come out to our events. In fact, in, in our documentary, we have uh, two people who have, were vocal opponents on both sides. We have people like Sam Harris, who was a very vocal supporter of, of Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. And, and he did a great job. He did a podcast episode called uh, uh, The Lesser of Two Evils. And he spent the first half hour tearing down Hillary Clinton mm. just to give you the case of why he's voting for her. Mm. And then our friend Joshua Becker, who has done, I think, four different Facebook Live sessions talking about his support for Donald Trump. Mm. And, and he is one of the people who inspired us to become minimalists. And he lives with a, his minimalist family, and he's a big supporter of Donald Trump. Joshua Becker, the author of, of Clutter Free with Kids, and 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 he did decide to take a political stance this time around. And so I think what we want to do is we want to provide perspective from from both sides. And and so we can go down this list of, well, who should I blame? You know, I've heard I've heard these these politicians now, Ryan, that they've come out or not politicians, but pundits, I should say, have come out and say, well, uh, especially people from the left, we need to blame white people for this election. Right. Because the white people, they just voted for. Uh, uh, this, in, in their words, they voted for this racist, misogynistic guy who who uh, is is a repudiation of of the progress we've made over the last eight years or whatever, and and that sounds true at the surface, but then you realize that wait a minute, Donald Trump got only one percent more of the white vote than Mitt Romney did, and, and no one was going out and calling Mitt Romney this this racist, misogynist, whatever, um, he was a pretty vanilla politician four years ago, a, a pretty standard Reagan-esque sort of uh, centrist Republican. And, and, and so you had, you had uh, this guy who, who, who got only 1% more of the white vote, so it wasn't like you had this huge white turnout. So then who do you blame? Do you blame white women? Because the strange thing about that is White women voted more for Donald Trump mm-hmm. than for Hillary Clinton, which blows me away. I was totally shocked to hear that statistic from the exit polls. Um, well, but of course, more more minorities certainly turned out. Black people, Hispanics, uh, especially women of color, uh, turned out for Hillary Clinton. But then you also hear that Donald Trump got more black women that voted for him. Right than Mitt Romney did. He got 7% of black women to vote for him. Right. Are those, peop- are those women, black women racist, misogynists? No, I don't think so. And I think the problem we're running into right now, and the, the reason that we have difficulty having discussions around this, is, you know what? We, we put people in this monolith and say, we blame the white people. We blame Hispanics. We blame, 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 blame these monoliths. Not all white people are the same. Not all Hispanic people are the same. By the way, Hispanics, almost a third of Hispanics voted for Donald Trump. Right. No one saw that coming Unbelievable, either. Unbelievable, yeah. It's crazy. And, 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 and so we're at this place where most of the polls were wrong, most of the pundits were, were wrong, and, and most of us are in shock. Whether we, The people who, who supported Donald Trump, they're in shock that their guy actually won. I mean, I, I was watching the, the night of the, the acceptance speech that Donald Trump gave. I saw Mike Pence, his vice president. He was standing there in the corner. He looked like he was in shock, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this actually happened. <laughs> and, and so you can go back to the weeks before the election, 
And everyone thought that, that Hillary Clinton had it in the bag. And it was similar to this whole Brexit thing that happened with, with Great Britain. Everyone was in shock of that as well. And so who do we blame? I think, Ryan, I think we blame both, both nobody and everybody. And, and here's what I mean by that. There's no single person or group who, who, who's to blame. Because if you want to blame a, a person who voted for Gary Johnson, well, let's say you shifted his vote to Hillary or Trump. Let's be honest. A single vote doesn't matter in this election. It didn't matter. One vote didn't change anything. So if we blame everyone, it's just the masses and the, the culmination uh, of everything that happened. We're all part of that. And once we realize we're all part of that, I think we can work together to be, to be more accepting. And Ryan, you and I know a lot of people who are in despair right now, who feel this sense of fear. And, and I have a few talking points here that of, of, I took some screenshots from social media and, and from different places on the web over the last week and some of our friends who are genuinely in fear. And so, Ryan, I want to read this to you. This is, this is out there and it's public. Our friend Bill, who lives in Kentucky, uh, we used to work with back in the corporate world. And he made this comment uh, the day after the election. He said, you know, I'm pretty excited. He's saying this in jest, obviously. I'm pretty excited for my disabled daughter to grow up in a society where it's acceptable for her to be both mocked and groped. Mm. And I, I feel his pain. And, and I, I, I want to say that I, I can't imagine that the 60 million people who, who voted for Donald Trump, and maybe it's my, me being overly optimistic, as I tend to be, mm. maybe the, I can't think that, that those, those 60 million people want a world where it's acceptable for Bill's disabled daughter to be mocked for being disabled and to be groped as, as a female. I don't think that that was the sentiment of of most of those people. No, I, I think you know I, I would consider myself one of those people who is in despair right now, but you know it's not it's not because of you know what's to come. It's not because uh, you know this mis- you know uh, this. Uh, person who has been led to believe by the media to be, you know, misogynist. You know, I don't know the guy personally, but yeah, certainly there are videos and plenty he of... Made, he made some misogynistic comments. Yes, There's no questions yes. about that. I'm just trying my hardest not to, like, just, you know, sit here and, like, call out all the all the bad things that, that we've all seen about Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, I'm more in despair because of the pulse on the nation, man. The fact that you have, you know, 60 million people who voted for someone that extreme uh, who is known to disrespect women, who is known to mock disabled people. Um, because it, it, what it tells me is that, A, like either 60 million people, uh, I'm not, and not every single one of them, but either millions of people don't know about all of this and, and they're not paying attention, or they're looking past it because that is how angry they are. Or they support it. There are, there's a small fraction. I mean, sure. He's I, I, would, I would say I'm going to be optimistic yeah, with yeah. you and say it's a very small portion of the people who actually support that type of behavior. But, you know, I'm in despair right now because our country is – it is divided, like, very much so between uh, this Democrat and, you know, Republican parties. I, I mean, it's unbelievable to me that there are, like, people – you know, thousands and thousands of people in the street, like, protesting. It's like, it makes no sense to me because we we have a democracy. We have rules around it. This is what's happened. There, you know, we can sit here and be against it. Uh, but at the end of the day, either you support the laws or you don't. And the fact that there's thousands of people who are in the streets uh, and, and they're they're not being violent. I mean, for all intents and purposes, like, they are, very, they are peaceful protests. There are some violence that has occurred during these protests, but for the, for the large portion of them, they have been pretty peaceful. But the fact that our country is, is in despair makes me in despair, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, it does. And, and, and I think there are a lot of people who are, are afraid right now. And, you know, it's, it's easy for the two of us, even though we have different political beliefs, it's easy for the two of us to, as, as white males, to, to be in, uh, to not have the same amount of fear as a person of color or a, as a woman. You know, I was talking to my partner, Bex, and, and obviously, you know, we have a three-year-old daughter, and, and, and it's going to be different for, for people who are, 
are not white males. And we, we it doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, I'm in a position where, where I'm, I'm feeling guilty for being a white male, but you know, it, it is what it is. And, and here's what I will say is that if you are in fear, if you are, if you do feel despair, um, we, we have to, you, the people who don't have that same fear, whether you voted for left or right or, or anywhere else, you need to be there to support those people who are afraid right now. Right. And especially if you voted for Donald Trump and, and, and you know someone who is, is a Muslim or you know someone who is a person of color who now thinks they're... Um, or if you know an immigrant who thinks they're going to get deported. Yeah, anyone who feels like a target. Yes, yeah, that, that's a great way to put it. If you know someone who feels like a target, we who, who don't feel like targets, we need to be willing to, to step up. And we, we need to be willing to support those people and let, let them know, you know what, I've got your back. I know you're afraid right now. And, and so, so really, that, that's what I want the message from this to be is not a message of, of blame, but this conversation needs to be a, you know what, no matter where we are right now, if you're afraid, know that we've got your back. Yeah, and blaming doesn't get us anywhere, man. It's like all, all the things that you listed that people are blaming, none of it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. Like the situation is what it is, and we can't go back. I mean, uh, we could sit here, you know, we could blame the Electoral College yeah. and, and that law. Do I agree with the electori- uh, Electoral College law? Like there are some circumstances that I've seen where, yeah, I agree with it. And then there are other circumstances where I see I don't agree with it. But yeah. the fact is, is that that is the the law that we have right now. If it's something we want to change and we have to look forward. Yes. We can't look back and be like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's this, per- it's this uh, you know, group's fault or it's this law's fault and we're going to go out and protest and try and change it. We can't. I mean, we can go out and protest, but uh, the chances of us changing the outcome is very, very slim. The only thing we can do is look forward. And I, and I think that's, you know, another thing about this conversation I really wanted to get through to our listeners is that we have to move forward. We cannot uh, stay here and wallow in this in shock. I'll be honest with you, though, man. I mean, I was <clears throat> the whole the whole time leading up to the election. Like how many times did I go to you? And I'm like, dude, I think Trump's going to get elected. Mm-hmm. And you, you were like, oh, no, you know, the polls. And and I was looking at the polls, too, pretty regularly. And they were kind of back and forth. But. You know, I was sh- uh, the the point. I was shocked. It wasn't when Trump got elected. I was shocked when my grandparents uh, a year and a half ago said that they were going to vote for Trump, and the, both sets of grandparents said they were going to vote for Trump in the primary. And like that, to me, like that was the sign of oh my god, like things are really getting out of control. And it's not because like my grandparents, you know, are the end all be all like who they vote for that's who is president but what i've noticed uh growing up is that uh out of every single presidential election that i've been alive for uh, there's one presidential election um the uh uh when uh, bush senior ran against clinton for the for the election yeah, yeah. um th- that they voted for bush senior and he didn't win but every other single election like it's been they they've been right on the money with it mm-hmm. so it's it's not that like I look at them again, like the end all be all, but I do f- look at my grandparents, like they have good heads on their shoulders. They're middle class, like they're 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 a pretty pretty good ju- uh, or a pretty good example of like your you know standard Americans. And the fact that you know people who I respect and like I know are level headed started talking about voting for Trump, like that is when like I started to to feel shocked. So it's kind of crazy to me too that like. We're all in disbelief. Like Trump got elected, I, we should have all been in disbelief when he got elected for the primaries. Like that's yeah, yeah. that's uh, that that was kind of the beginning of it all. Yeah, and and I was in disbelief to be honest uh, with you, but I also realized that 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 was a weird circumstance, and it didn't. It, you know, there were seventeen people running, and and it it, it just seemed odd. The, the whole thing seemed odd, and it didn't seem like it was it. it it was impossible, and this one seemed impossible. I'll tell you the reason it seemed impossible to me is I can tell you this, is um, I've put myself in a bubble the last five or six years, yeah. and I, I've surrounded my, and, and I, in fact, I encourage people, let me, so, so let me be clear, I encourage you to put yourself in a bubble, but uh, let, me, let me expand on that, right? <laughs> All I, right, guys, that's it for the show. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. I encourage you to put yourself in a bubble. I've put myself in a bubble of people who share similar values.
to me. We don't always have the same beliefs. So we have different paths to get to those values. So Ryan and I have different beliefs about certain things, but we have the same values. My, my friend, the pastor friend I was talking to this weekend have radically different beliefs, but we, we are, uh, we're at a place where we're, we get we get to this we eventually through a very securitous route get to the same values at least most of the time I, I think, and I think it's the same with all the the people in my my first tier my my primary relationships and also I think my secondary relationships we all have the same values and then there's that that periphery the tertiary relationships and those people will, will vary and and you know they're in and out of my life uh, accordingly but I tell you I've put myself in, in in the bubble with the primary relationships. And, and, and with those secondary relationships. But what I haven't done a good job of, and this is my fault, is, is expanding that bubble a little bit to welcome in more points of view and different beliefs and, and having uh, the people who may have radically different political beliefs from me. And, and so I called up a bunch of friends this, this weekend uh, uh, once I stopped coughing every five seconds and, and, you know, I, I find it interesting because a lot of the people I grew up with, so I grew up in a, a predominantly black neighborhood, and I say predominantly because if you were to take me out, it would have just been an all-black neighborhood. Um, I was the token white kid, although if you go four or five blocks down, it was a you know, relatively white town. Suburb, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, uh, but the neighborhood I grew up in uh, was, was a place that was pretty much all black, and, and, and the the points of view of, of many of my friends when, when I talked to them this this weekend was not that surprised, honestly. Mm. They're like, come on, Josh, you know, you know what this country is like. And they're feeling oppressed. They're not feeling scared, but they're feeling wow. like, yeah. like, you know what, like, you should have expected this. Like, wow. You don't you know what what country this is? This is a country that's built on slavery. Now I understand that is that can be a pessimistic view and and looking backwards, but it's also their worldview and, and their mm. reality uh, much of the time. And I was talking to my pastor friend, our our pastor friend, about it this weekend. Ryan. God, man, that hurts so bad. <laughs> well, I was talking to him about that, and and because um, he grew up in the town, although on the other side of town, and and. Um, he, he was trying to communicate with his parents. So, so my brother's black, and, and he was like, even, even Josh and Jerome have had two different lo- lives after, yeah, after high school, right? Even though we, we grew up in the same place, uh, we haven't necessarily had the same opportunities. And part of that, part of that has to do with the color of our skin. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, even in high school, man, like, you know, when Jerome would be driving around, he got pulled over. All the time, man. Yeah. All he's, the time. He's been tased and it's tased twice in in his life. Now, uh, have I ever even been in a situation where I've been close to getting tased? Right. No, of no. course not. Um, and 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 so we we are we are in in a, a country where that does happen. Does that mean that most cops are are racist or most cops have it out for of black people? Not. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means the the propensity for it to happen to you if you're black is much higher. Right. And and that's where the whole Black Lives Matter movement comes from. It isn't. They're not saying that all lives don't matter. But what they're saying is that no, not all lives matter. If black lives don't matter as well, and and so you have a lot of of black people who are are either distraught, uh, and then you have a lot of uh, women, especially who who I've talked to. Uh, my friend Annie uh, back in Dayton, uh, who are just in this afraid a period, uh, th- th- this period of fear in, in their lives, and so I think we need to reach out to these people and 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 who who we have not extended our bubble to. And I, again, I I am I'm blaming myself here if I'm blaming anyone for not extending my bubble to to people. Um, as opposed to trying to get into their bubble, yeah. l- let's open up our bubble, our values uh, of living a meaningful life to anyone who, who, who is afraid, to anyone who has this, this despair in their lives right now. Now is the time for us to reach out. It's crazy. I, th- I, thought, I thought I had a 
good bubble going on. Well, you, <laughs> like you I, do. You, you have you have because, a much better one than I. Well, because my my well my family. I don't. I think I'm the only. I would be willing to say I'm the only one in my family on both sides out of like 20 family members I can think of. I'm probably the only one that didn't vote for Trump. And um, with that, even like, the, and that's what made me nervous about yeah. him being elected because they're all and, and they're all in people. Ohio and New York, like they're all in big states. But even then, I still was like, okay, you know, I'm talking to Josh. Josh is reassuring me that Hillary's going to get elected. Everyone that I, you know, all my close friends, all you know, there's 20 family members, but I got you know, uh, 50 50 friends around me, or you know, Facebook friends that I'll see their feed or whatever, um, or people I'll run into that you know they, th- you know, they're not going to vote for Trump. So yeah, like okay, okay, probably Trump's not going to get it. But it's just amazing, how, amazing how I have. I feel like I have extended my bubble, and still I live in a bubble, if that makes any sense. Well, I think – but I, I think your approach is much better than mine. I don't know – I don't have a person in my my first-tier or second-tier relationships. I don't have a single person in, in, in that bubble who voted for Trump. Yeah, I don't – I don't have a single person uh, yeah. in my friends, family. If I do, it's very few, but yeah. I, but your, your family. You, yeah. You have – and, and your, your whole family – I don't have the same sort of extended yeah. family. I, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't have a ton of. I mean, I can't, I talk to all of them, you know, a few times a year, but I don't. I don't. Yeah, see they, them they might be enough. in your, your tertiary yeah, relationships. Yeah, and but you still love them, care about them, but it yeah. doesn't mean you <clears throat> spend a. Yeah. Actually, no, I take that back. I definitely, yeah, I, in my primary, I definitely do have, um, yeah, some people, some friends that I have, yeah, who who do who I know voted for Trump. Okay. Well, well, and and but we we intentionally put ourselves in these bubbles, and again, I think it's okay, but I think we c- need to continue to be intentional about about that bubble and, yeah. and about expanding it. I mean, for God's sake, we moved to an island in Montana. Right, a liberal island. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you look at the red, where it's a red state, there are two little blue dots, Bozeman and and and, uh, and Missoula. And, and so, and it's a, I mean, this place is emphatically white. And if you get outside of Missoula, it's aggressively white. Yeah. Um, and, and, that was, I mean, we've been here for four years, and it was really shocking to me. And it's one of the reasons that, that, and I've never talked about this publicly, but it's one of the reasons I want to leave Missoula personally is um, there are some diversity in opinions here for sure, but it is, uh, it is not diverse, and certainly not what I'm used to. You know, I moved here from Dayton, Ohio, which is 45% African American, to Missoula, Montana, which is 105 percent white. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> um, oh, we need to see your source on that. Some people are extra white here. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, although I, I, I'll tell you, that some of the most meaningful conversations I have here are when I go to I, I go to the sauna like four or five times a week, and I'm the only white person that goes to the sauna where I go to pretty much. Uh, it's all uh, American Indians hmm. um, who who are either from the reservation up in Browning and they've moved down here for jobs and, and so forth um, or for school. And and some of the best conversations I have, many of the conversations I have are about race, and they're different from the conversations I had you know, growing up in, in Ohio. Well, they're conversations about they're, – they're even, it's a different kind of oppression that these people have have felt – and I, I realize that um, quite often we don't, when we put ourselves in these bubbles, we don't get to talk about the, uh, the feelings that, that yeah. other people feel. Uh, and, and the feelings aren't always rational that we feel, right? That's why they're feelings. <laughs> Emotions have very little to do with rationality. Uh, we feel what we feel despite what we think. And, and me being a very rational person, it's often easy for me, my, my first inclination is to dismiss what someone feels because, well, that's not the most rational approach. But the truth is, that doesn't matter. Right. You, 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 can, you can win the argument but still lose the argument because you didn't change how someone feels. And, and I think that's quite often where we go wrong. And that's where our friend Sam Harris, um, he had a great conversation um, after, uh, after the election, and, and clearly he was a Hillary supporter, and uh, um, it, I, he did a great job of articu- articulating all the rationale behind a, a Hillary presidency, but it wouldn't sway anyone's emotions, I didn't no. feel like. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what won this election for many people 
where, where, where people felt alienated, and, and so they wanted to vote for something different. But different isn't always better. Different can be much worse. Different can be much better. Different is just different. It's yeah. not inherently better or worse. And, and so I think we need to continue to expand, adjust expand our bubbles, the bubble, yeah. contract our bubbles sometimes yeah. to, 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 so that we can expand somewhere else. Yeah. You know, uh, I was watching this interview, or it was an interview, it was like Michael Moore on a panel on MSNBC, and it was like a 45-minute long segment, um, and he just he did an amazing job of like helping me understand how I need to expand my bubble more. Mm. I mean, he started talking about how, you know, he's like, you go to Flint, Michigan, and they can't drink their water. Uh, no one knows that. I mean, there was some national attention on that. And then a President Obama went out, drank some water, and left. But nothing has changed right. si- since all that. And uh, he, he was talking about, you know, like the, the American um, just working class that, that uh, a lot of us are disconnected from. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you and I who have uh, – we've kind of um, – started this atypical work Mm -hmm. and you know we're able to support ourselves you know we don't have the nine to five but (laughs) there are millions of americans out there who have the nine to five and they want they want something different Mm -hmm. and uh i i uh i I just can't stress enough to anyone out there who you know feels like um they don't have a good grasp on that (laughs) on that type of uh not that type i don't know what the word i'm looking for is but people in that world if you don't have any association with people like that, like go out and find people to talk to who you would normally not talk to, to understand like where, where their pain is, what, you know, what their suffering is and why they would, they want change so bad that they're willing to ignore all of the misogyny, racist things that had come up with Trump. They want change so bad that they're willing to look past all of that just to have something different. And I think you and I are in a fortunate position because we do get to interact with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people when we go on the road, and they literally are from all walks of life. Right. And yeah. It's. <clears throat> I mean, we we have every ethnicity: black, white, Hispanic, uh, American Indian, Indian American. <laughs> I mean, we we have people from from uh, multiple countries who who will come out poor, rich, CEOs and factory workers at the same event. And we're all asking, how do I live a more meaningful life? Yeah. And we need... No matter who they're voting for. (laughs) Right, right. And in fact, I think that tends to be why they vote for who they vote for. They think, this is going to help me lead a more meaningful life. And and, uh, I think what we also need to do is realize that no matter who you vote for, whoever is in office, the, the person who will make the most difference in your life is you. Whether there's a a President Obama, a President Bush, a President Clinton, or a President Trump, the person who will make the largest difference in your life is you. And that's through the optimistic pursuit of creating the person you want to become. Who's that person that is on the horizon for you? And that is the person you should aspire to be. I I am... I, I, I am hopeful here, Ryan. We, there's a, a pod, one of my favorite podcasts I listen to is The Brilliant Idiots, which you're, you're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, it's a awesome. white guy and a black guy, yeah. Andrew Schultz and Charlemagne. And Charlemagne is this, this uh, hip-hop uh, critic, um, uh, radio guy, radio host. Uh, he hosts a, a, the largest morning show uh, in the country now. It's called The Breakfast Club. And he has a book coming out next August, which I've already pre-ordered. It's called Black Privilege. Mm. opportunity comes to those who create it. And while I certainly am not going to say there isn't a such thing as white privilege, there, there is, but his, his argument is that, you know what, there's also other privilege. There's black privilege, there's female privilege. And he said, I couldn't get to where I am right now if I wasn't black. I couldn't give you the same, the same perspective if I wouldn't have grown up in Monk's Corner, South Carolina on a dirt road right. and sold crack as a teenager. Uh, and I couldn't have gotten to where I am now without those experiences. And he does a much better job articulated than, than I would. But w- what I realize is that, yes, we're not all born equal. Ryan, you and I grew up really poor. You grew up in trailer parks. I grew up on, on, on uh, WIC and food stamps, government assistance. 
And I think my trailers were nicer than the places you lived in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, when I was when I was living on Warren Street, man, like I mean, I, you grew up in like shacks, man. Yeah, the the house that I grew up in is is boarded up now. Yeah, and and um, you know, the in the neighborhood I grew up in, most of the houses that it's funny, I, I've gone back there a few. T- I would never want to move back there. And not because it's a black, white, white neighborhood, whatever. It's a mostly Hispanic neighborhood now. But most of the houses in the neighborhood are actually burned down. There was a, a, a slumlord there, oh. Scott. I won't mention his last name. But uh, he owned several blocks of houses there. And mysteriously, over a two- or three-year period, the majority of them burned down. Huh. A- and he made a lot of money off of insurance claims. Wow. Uh, and, in fact, he got investigated for it later. So, oh, wow. Um, uh, and, and and what I'll tell you is that it was it was a terrible neighborhood. I would not want to go back to to living that way. But I also want to continue to understand people who are are living that way. Yeah. Because yeah, after so you and I left that that world and sort of climbed the corporate ladder and slowly transitioned into this other world mm-hmm. of of not wealth necessarily, but we were we were uh, either upper middle class or or rich in in you know, making close to a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in the corporate world. But, you know, when I walked away from that at age 30, there have been years where I have been close to the poverty line. I mean, right. I, there, there's a year we made uh, $23,000 in, in, in a year. Yeah. And and so what I can tell you is that that year I made $23,000, I was happier, more fulfilled, and, and had a, a better sense of the person I was and it was living a more meaningful life, a more purpose-driven life, a more intentional life at $23,000 a year than when I was making nearly 10 times that in the corporate world because I had identified what my values are. And so I think we need to look toward our values. And we go back, Ryan and I wrote a whole book about this, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. It's our first book. And you hear us talk about our values all the time, health and relationships and and contribution, and giving, and uh, uh, growth, and creativity. But, but really, within those values, there are all these sort of sub-values. Right? When you talk about relationships, well, what does that mean? It means, it means caring, and loving, and, and, and giving, but also understanding, and, and accepting, and, and appreciating other people, right? Respecting other people's beliefs, mm-hmm. even though they may be different from yours. And so when we really get into our values, and one of those values is, is people or relationships, we need to identify, I mean, we need to start asking ourselves some difficult questions. Who's the person I want to become? And how do I get there? How do I strengthen my relationships? And so, if anything, out of this whole, whole uh, election that has created this dichotomy, I don't want to have the sentiment of, well, here are the bad guys and here are the good guys. There's this tweet that I, I saw that a friend of ours retweeted. Let me see if I can find it for you, Ryan. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just hearing that statement right off the bat, good guys versus bad guys, I mean, that is that is not the attitude I'm going to adopt <laughs> moving forward. And that that's good. It, this, this woman, she and I understand, she's scared, and I, I totally understand the sentiment. I just think this point of view is a mistaken point of view. Yeah. Uh, her name's Kim. She said, if you voted for Trump, unfollow me, block me, either, please. I don't want you in my life. Mm. And and so, I think that 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 is closing off the bubble and shrinking the bubble, as opposed to trying to understand people. And what I'll even go a step farther is let's try to understand the people the, the people who are actually racists and the people who are bigots or misogynists. We don't need to accept their beliefs, and they don't have the same values as us. But let's do a better job of understanding what spurs that. What's the spark there that makes someone racist or misogynistic so that we can make sure we, we don't include that in our recipe mm-hmm. for, for our own values, our own beliefs, our own interests and desires and discourse? How do we, how do we move forward uh, by, by understanding those people better as well? Maybe not even tolerating the, those people. Uh, in fact, not tolerating those people. Certainly not respecting racist opinions, uh, not respecting misogynistic viewpoints, but doing a better job that, to to understand where they're coming from, so that we don't make the same mistakes that other people make. Yeah. Yeah. This is a. Uh, it's a crazy time, man. I mean, for me, you know, if if I had like. 
some final thoughts. I would say I'm in support of the democracy we have in place. Yeah. And well, it, I mean, technically, it's a constitutional republic, so yeah. so we don't all vote for everything, and that's the so the electoral college argument or, or whatever. Now, there are some places where you can you you do get to vote for, you know, California is a good example. I think there, the the booklet about the their election there was two hundred and forty eight pages long because people get to vote for pretty much everything. It's essentially a democracy on a statewide level, right? But I, I guess what I'm saying is 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 the the system we have in place. Um, whether you want, whether I want to be or not, I'm signed up for it for for those laws. And uh, the only thing I can do moving forward is, you know, hope that Trump does a really, really good job and blows everyone away. I mean, how many times have you and I said that there should be a, you know a presidential candidate that runs on a bunch of you know crazy right wing stuff, gets elected, and then goes into the White House and says, "Hey, you know what?" I'm not really going to do all that stuff. Sorry, I kind of lied during my my campaign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and like he was really going to actually make some change. So you know, hopefully that's what happens. But I, I will say, I think there is change coming for better or for worse. And uh, I will, you know, I'm not going to root for the captain of the ship to fail because uh, I certainly don't want to. Uh, I sh- certainly don't want the ship to crash. Um, but you know, if the captain starts. Um, uh, uh, Oh, I don't know, infringing on people's human rights. Yes. Or starts uh, setting a you know bad example for the rest of Americans and the rest of the world, then yeah, I'll, I will speak up about stuff like that, and I will certainly stand up for anyone's rights. Um, but you know, it doesn't matter who's president. Um, I would always stand up for people's rights. So <clears throat> you know, I, you know, like I said, for me, it's it's not about blaming anyone. It's not about. Uh, uh, you know, being angry or, or you know, trying. I'm not going to go out and, and protest the uh, electoral college. Um, I think that maybe it should change and we should look into that. And I'd be happy to sign a petition to get that looked at. Um, uh, but, but for all intents and purposes, like Trump is going to be president. And what else can we do besides hope that he does a really, really good job? This is an opportunity for us to move forward. And, and not close off our bubbles, but to expand them. And I think it's an opportunity for us to better understand people we didn't understand before. Yeah, Let's it's a wake up call for it's a wake up call for people to. Yes, absolutely, it's a wake up call, wake up call for people to expand their bubbles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I listened to the 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 media mm-hmm. uh, on this, and pe- this was a repudiation of much of the media as well. People dislike the discourse that's going on in the media. The the, the self-importance or the, the being self-congratulatory. And, and hopefully, if anything, this conversation between us uh, will, you know, I don't feel self-important about this thing. Mm-mm. And in fact, I, I want other points of view in my life. And that's why, you know, I say, I, and don't get me wrong, I love Missoula, I love Montana, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. But but I also realize there aren't the same points of view here. So if that if you're in a, a place right now and you're listening to this and you feel like, well, I don't have those points of view around me. Well, the internet a gives you the opportunity to to reach out uh, across the the ones and zeros to other people. But it also may mean moving somewhere else to where you can have you can surround yourself with a bunch of different viewpoints. And hopefully those viewpoints help you strengthen your values. Your values won't change necessarily, but you'll uncover your values, and maybe your belief system will change that that get you to those values. So let's take this as an opportunity. Let's move forward. Let's support people who are in fear, who feel like they're in danger, Uh, and let's, uh, let's create something meaningful together. Realize that you are the person who's going to make the most change in your life despite any obstacles anyone in government or elsewhere puts up for you, uh, it just makes it a bit more difficult. And, and, and so if, if you were playing the game on novice or intermediate before, it may mean you're playing the, this, this video game called life on a more difficult or expert level. And, it may, and these times may be more difficult, but realize you have the support of people who do care about you. And, uh, We'll leave you with that. Yeah, I, th- I think I would just add one more thing, that if you go out and throw yourself into a situation where you're around, if it's one person or a bunch of people who have radically different beliefs than you, then uh, you've got to keep the the anger on, under check. 
Yes, and Be- you can do that by listening. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it, don't go out. It's it's not about going out and convincing other people that they're wrong. It's about going out and listening and and uh, understanding why other people feel the way they feel. Because I'll tell you, like, if you go to a Trump supporter, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to expand my bubble. I'm going to go to, like, you know, a pro-Trump rally. And uh, you might go there and get really, really uh, ticked off, and it'd be really easy to start yelling at people. Um, but doing that is never, ever going to move someone towards your side. If anything, getting angry and uh, uh, reacting in a visceral manner is, is not going to have someone look at you and say, oh, wow. I'm going to go, I'm not going to support Trump anymore. It's just going to make them hold on to their Trump values or whatever values, you know, uh, even more. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, just be careful because that's kind of a, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You want to go out and expand your bubble, but you also don't want to go out and start arguments with people either. On that note, I mean, I think it's important to realize that to expand the bubble, one of the best ways to expand the bubble is to contribute. Yeah. And so listening is one way to expand the bubble, but, but contribution is, is another way to expand the, the bubble. So maybe ask yourself, how can I use this as an opportunity to give to other people? Because there are a lot of people out there that. now who, who, who need help. And, and whether they're a Trump supporter or a Hillary supporter, they didn't vote at all, that there are people who, who need your help. And if you have the capacity to help someone else, one of the best ways to understand them is, is to give because you're understanding what their needs are. In order to give, you have to know what is needed. And so understanding someone's needs helps you better understand that person. And I think that's really the reason that, that Ryan and I wanted to have this conversation. But also it's the reason, it goes back to why we started the, the Minimalists six years ago is when Ryan came to me after he had done his packing party and simplified his life, and and it was about a year or so after I had simplified my life, maybe a year and a half, and it was, hey, maybe I think other people can find value in this message. It's not a political message. It's not even an environmentalist message. It is a message, uh, is a recipe uh, of things that have worked that have helped improve our lives. So let's do that together. No matter where you are in the political spectrum, let's find ways to help improve other people's lives with our creations, with our donations, with our time, with our attention, with our acceptance, with our love, and with everything we've got. Thanks for listening, y'all. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Every little thing you think that you need every little thing you think that you need every little thing that's just feeding your greed oh I bet that you'd be fine without it every little thing that you gotta have every little thing that you gotta have you gotta reach for Gotta grab, oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it. So tear your eyes away, or tear.